Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here back at the Bucharest Forum and uh, after last week's conversation about building resilience. Today, we are actually continuing to speak about recovery. Uh, I'm Michael Robo. I am uh, the founding partner at Emerging Europe, a London-based uh, intelligence, news, and community platform looking at 23 countries of Central, Southeastern, and Eastern Europe. And today I am uh, with uh, Anna Bierde, Vice President for Europe and Central Asia at the World Bank. And we're going to be talking about recovery. So only a few days ago, the World Bank published a report uh, talking about uh, you know, emerging and developing Europe and Central Asia and th the fact that they will contract by 4.4% this year. And the growth next year is expected to be between 1.1% and 3.3%. Uh, Which parts of the region do you think will bounce back uh, fast or faster? Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, and so great to be with you. Uh, so yes, we, we did recently uh, release our uh, economic outlook report, and in it we did uh, provide uh, the forecast for 2020 as well as a forecast in the form of a range between 1.1 uh, and 3.3% for 2021. And it's very difficult to say which part of the region will rebound the, the fastest because there's so much uncertainty in forecasting during during a pandemic. Uh, but what our analysis does show is that most likely uh, Central Europe and the Baltics would rebound the fastest. And the range we have given is about 2.1 to 4.2 percent. And we give a range because of the uncertainty. But the, the, the uh, rebounds there would be because of, a, of strength in economic activity, uh, including from industrial production, retail and exports, and of course, uh, being supported by bolstering and trade also as the euro area uh, economic activity uh, picks up. It would be followed most likely in terms of a second group of countries in Central Asia and then a third group of countries in the South Caucasus. But of course, all of this depends a lot on the pace of economic activity in terms of how well it and quick it picks up. Uh, of course, also availability of a, of a vaccine, as well as how quickly global trade picks up. So uh, yes, it's it's the economic uh, activity, but it's also uh, availability and distribution of uh, of a vaccine, and uh, and of course you know uh, how the pandemic itself will will um, e evolve. Do you think that there is still a danger that uh, some of the economies will, or the economy, all of them, will contract further next year? I mean, if we're looking at part of the of of the region, like you know, certain countries, the number of cases is really going up right now. Absolutely. And I would say that uncertainty is really the sort of dominant element in forecasting during this pandemic. And you're absolutely right. The uncertainty really does come from um, what happens with the virus evolution. We are, of course, going through a period of spikes across the, the region right now, but also uh, what will those spikes mean in terms of uh, restrictions that could further uh, prevent and hamper economic activity and absolutely the timing uh, uh, and the availability and the distribution of a vaccine. Those are all elements that make it very hard to predict, which is why we decided for uh, 2021 to really focus on a range. So the range being 1.1% to 3.3%. I have to say, even if we are at the lower side of the range at 1.1%, we are estimating that all subgroups of countries in the region will have positive growth with the exception of the countries in Eastern Europe. So uh, do you think there is a danger that we will actually not see growth at all? There's always a risk of that. Um, what we did see was uh, this year how hard it is to predict. You know, in, this, <clears throat> in the spring when we came out with our economic forecast, we gave a range. And that range was, uh, you know, we had at the down the downside risk, uh, if you will, or the downside scenario was 4.4%, and it did actually materialize. We are predicting that for 2020, this region will end up at a contraction of 4.4%. So I do think that there is a risk that we will end up at the very, very 
lower level of growth for 2021. And it is possible that in a few months we do revisions of our forecast, absolutely. So in the, in the report, you're also focusing on two areas and one is health, the other one is education. Why do you think or how do you think these two areas uh, might help increase the region's uh, competitiveness? It's a very, very uh, great question. And I'm very happy that each time when we put out an economic outlook report, which we do every six months, we also put out a companion piece on something uh, very pertinent. So in the spring, it was, of course, on COVID. And now in the fall uh, version, it's been looking at two very important issues around human capital. One is on health risk factors and the other one is on tertiary education. And on health, uh, the uh, Europe and Central Asia region is a region of an aging population, which means that the workforce is an aging population. And what we need to do is make sure uh, that this aging population, if you will, adults, uh, in order to have global competitiveness, also have better health outcomes. And what we did in the report was take a look at uh, three health risks, which are particularly uh, pertinent for upper income and middle income countries. And these are around uh, obesity, uh, smoking and uh, engaging in binge drinking. And what we found in the region was that in all those three dimensions, the numbers are quite high. So obesity, we're, all, we're at about 18% of the population in the region. When it comes to smoking, it's about 26% of the region. And when it comes to engaging in binge drinking, it's about 21% of the region. And why does this matter? It matters because it impacts productivity. So what we found was that we could have a 10% loss of productivity, both from the obesity and from the smoking, and as much as a 20% loss in productivity uh, from uh, the binge drinking. And this is important because productivity is something that we have been really working on and is something that is very important in the region in order to be competitive and in order to obtain higher and sustained growth. So these two areas are quite crucial for the, for the region, as you said. But I think that, you know, the, the COVID pandemic is actually maybe a good time to look at a broader, uh, you know, from a broader perspective and, and, and maybe look at the, the, the reforms that need to be introduced uh, regardless of the pandemic or, or not. Do you think that the, the governments in the region are... Um, understanding that and that they are actually thinking of uh, that broader perspective, these reforms that need to be introduced? Uh, thank you, Andrew. And yes, uh, a couple of uh, perspectives on that. First of all, the focus on health risk factors is important because also a recovery from COVID from a health perspective has a, a very significant correlation with sort of the underlying health uh, and healthiness, if you will, of the population. So we do believe that this is very timely to sort of zoom in on some of these risk, health risk factors in order to also make sure that the population stays strong and resilient in the face of this virus. Uh, but secondly, I absolutely think this is a good time to also consider continue to very much focus on the reform agenda. And I'm actually quite uh, pleased that in all of my conversations with clients in the region, there is a real emphasis on the short-term immediate needs, but equally a uh, really keen focus on making sure that we don't lose momentum for reforms that had started. And let me just maybe mention a few of those reforms that I think uh, are very, very important and come across a lot in my discussions with, with, with clients in the region. Uh, every region, as I mentioned, is really focused on increasing the level of productivity labor productivity, but also enhancing the role, if you will, of the private sector in both the management as well as in the financing of the economy, and also making sure that the government and public sector can be as efficient as possible. So this is an ongoing transition in the region that I think is as relevant uh, now as it was before. The other one uh, is 
around the transition to a greener economy. And I think this is also something that the region really, really is focusing on. I'm very pleased that the World Bank has really partnered with a lot of countries in the region to focus on this, whether it's the energy sector, the transport sector, or building, building resilience because of the importance of agricultural exports or of the large number of population that live in coastal areas. So greening the economy, building a more resilient economy through that transition to uh, lower carbon and more sustainable development solutions, if you will. And then I think the third area is around innovation, which touches very closely also on digitization. And I think what we've learned from the pandemic is that the digital framework in countries needs to be so strong because we have found that just look at schools, so many children in, in, in around the world, and including in Europe and Central Asia, were out of school. Uh, many countries were able to teach them and educate them remotely. Many countries found that it was actually not as robust as, as they had hoped. So I think one area we would also like to continue to support is really making sure that the digital infrastructure, the digital framework, and the regulation around digital is as strong and robust as it can be to really support the recovery. And my final, and this is something that's very close to my heart, is that we need to continue strengthening social protection systems because what I also think we found, despite the region actually having a legacy of a strong social safety net and social, social protection scheme, we found that we needed to make sure we were targeting properly, not having people fall through the cracks in terms of vulnerability, enlarging the beneficiaries and making sure fiscally that we had the funding in place to be able to administer these programs and make sure resources got to the people who needed them the most. It, it's, it's great that you mentioned uh, digital transformation because this is one of the topics that I also wanted to touch upon. Uh, what about uh, innovation and entrepreneurship? Do you think that this is also a time where we can, when we can awaken the, the spirit of cre creativity um, and uh, you know, foster collaboration uh, across the region and maybe beyond? Yes, I think so. And uh, I think there's, there's a real opportunity to sort of unleash the energy of the region. And, you know, young people are really the engine for that. And this maybe allows me to speak a little bit about the education part of our, uh, of our report that, that I didn't yet mention, which is we looked at... Um, the importance of tertiary education in the region. And what we found was that uh, the region actually lacks quite a bit when it comes to uh, reaching that tertiary education level. Uh, so about 40% of uh, the population between 30 and 34 years of age have a uh, higher education. Of course, it varies a lot. You know, Russia is way above 60%. Central Asia is more around 20%. Uh, but nevertheless, we believe that this is something to focus on because we think that for the future, the region really needs high skills and needs the skills to make sure that they can meet a future that has more private sector-led growth, more sustainable development, but also a much more uh, inclusive and a digitally enabled uh, economy. So these are skills that, uh, that we really need to work on because the basic education is a good starting point, but it doesn't give all the skills that you need for that type of economy to come. And for, if you will, the, the, the work of the future, the nature of work of the future. I would like to mention what's interesting. We usually see women trailing behind men. When it comes to tertiary education, what we found with our uh, report was that women actually are at about 46% compared to men at about 35%. So we need to make sure that in this case on gender, we focus also on men not trailing women when it comes to higher education. And uh, do you think we are ready to uh, build back better, basically, everything around us, the economy, but not only the economy. So uh, Build Back Better is such an interesting concept because uh, we it touches on so many things. So what for me, what it means for the region in Europe and Central Asia is certainly that we build more resilient economies and more resilient economies, both in terms of our physical infrastructure, in terms of our human 
uh, uh, capital and in terms of our natural resource base. So I think we need to work on all of that. The resilient economy for me is very much about good governance, corporate governance, making sure institutions are strengthened to be able to be resilient and be able to collaborate and coordinate across to be able to respond to crisis when they emerge but also very much the financial sector, making sure we have access to finance for firms, for individuals, for entrepreneurs, to be able to uh, go out and uh, essentially pursue their dreams and be able to contribute to the economy. They're very much around the human capital. It's as I mentioned, I think we need to focus much more on the tertiary education, but also on the health of the, of the population in the region. And this is both young people as well as adults because of the aging nature of the population in the region. And the natural resources, because this is a region that needs to continue its energy transition, but also very much safeguard its natural resources like water scarcity in many parts of the region, or areas around the importance of effective and productive uh, practices around irrigation, agricultural production, both for its own food security, but also for agricultural exports, which are so important to economies around the region. So uh, I mentioned in the, at the beginning of, uh, of our fireside chat, I mentioned a, uh, the panel discussion that I did last week here at the Bucharest Forum. And one of the takeaways there was that uh, you know, one of the one of the speakers said that being resilient means to be prepared with ten times as much as we need than just you know whatever we need at the moment, uh, just to be safe going forward. Do, what do you think about that concept? Um, so yes, uh, I think if it's one thing we've learned coming out of this is that. Uh, many countries around the world have found themselves not so prepared because of the unknowns and the uncertainties around the nature of this virus, but also so hard to predict what comes down the pike. You know, when, how long will it be? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? As we were talking, will the vaccine come out soon? Will it be able to be deployed and distributed uh, where it's needed the most? Uh, so I do think that it requires us to think very carefully about how do we build sort of buffers and resilience when we go forward. Uh, and those buffers are, of course, strong uh, financial systems. Uh, I think one thing we've been trying to do very much in the region is to make sure that we continue to work with countries on uh, both macro and fiscal management. A lot of countries are spending more now which is natural. They're not collecting as much revenue because there's a lot of uh, uh, mitigation measures in place to support the economy, um, including, of course, tax deferrals and, and just smoothening out the impact on people. We need to get back when we can to uh, the good uh, sort of fiscal management and fiscal prudence that is required to build up those buffers. But I also think, and this is something I, I do actually see as, uh, as a positive, if you will, coming out of this, I think... Uh, all of us have realized, uh, and decision makers and policy makers have realized, that we're quite vulnerable to, to unknowns and uncertainties. And I think we need to take this time to really learn um, a lot and learn from each other and engage really as a community to make sure that we, uh, we see what are some of the good practices coming out of managing through a, a very sudden uh, crisis and how do we make sure that we take advantage of all the capacities that are around us to not duplicate the efforts because that would be too costly, but rather capitalize on the skills and the knowledge and the research and the resources that are out there. And I see that also as a role for the World Bank Group to be able to bring and convene policymakers and share experiences on what some of those good practices and good lessons can be so that we can really be the most efficient and effective in building up our resilience for future crises. So my final question, uh, what opportunities do you think have been unfolded by the pandemic that we you know, not, did not necessarily uh, expect? So the opportunities, I think, uh, are uh, pretty much tied to what, what I was talking about in terms of working together. I think we uh, have seen and we saw from the very start just 
a huge uh, effort by various communities, whether it's scientific community, development community, financial community, uh, you know, non-governmental organization community, to come together and to try to raise uh, awareness, try to learn from each other, try to be quick on findings and on mechanisms for recovery that we can share with each other. I think that's one thing we can we can take away. And I think at the more sort of individual level, uh, I think we've all had our lives disrupted in a massive way, in a way that we we really uh, you know never envisaged. And I think it's been a good time to also sort of reflect a little bit on how will I live differently going forward in terms of taking care of our environment, taking care of our communities, taking care also of being efficient and careful with the resources that we have around us. So I think if it's one thing we can take away is that maybe we become a little bit, uh, you know, less is more at, at, at all levels. And I think that will actually provide a good basis for a more sustainable future for all. Let's close with this positive note. On this positive note, uh, thank you very much, Anna. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Andrew.